Several weeks ago, we began a new message series called Love Wins. As we began to look through the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, we began to ask the question, what does it mean for our relationships to grow, our friendships, our, our marriages, our families, and our relationship with God? And, and I got to tell you, um, as we were talking in our worship team meeting uh, uh, this week, we're closing up the book of Ruth. We're going to finish it, and, and I'm going to miss it. I have had such a good time in this series. It's got to be one of my favorite series that, uh, that I have preached, and so I'm, I'm, I'm really blessed by this. And if you've missed any of these messages over the last four weeks, um, you can always find them online in our app store or in our, uh, on our website. You can check them out there and see them. We record them every week, and you can share them with a friend if you want to. But if you've missed a few of these weekends, let me uh, give you a, kind of a synopsis because the Ruth is a story and it's a story that, and so it's hard to jump in on week four and the end, last chapter. Three weeks ago in chapter one, we started talking about faithful friends. And we start, started talking about this love story with, that starts like most love stories do with a tragedy. There's a family, a Jewish family in Bethlehem and named Elimelech and Naomi, and they, they're hitting a famine, and they're hungry, and so they decide to look for greener grass over in Moab. And so they pack up their two boys, and they leave town, and tragedy begins to hit. When they get to Moab, Elimelech dies. And if that wasn't bad enough, uh, her, Naomi's two sons marry Moabite women, which would not have been part of the plan. And, and if it, as if that wasn't bad enough, that by the time they've been there about 10 years, both of Naomi's sons also die. And so now it's just Naomi and her two Moabite daughters-in-law. Naomi is brokenhearted, and she decides, you know what, it's time for me to go home. There's nothing here for me. She tells her daughters-in-law, stay here. You know, you could still have a life. You could still get married. Stay here, and I'm going back to Bethlehem. But the Bible says that Ruth clung to Naomi. Ruth wouldn't let her go. Ruth, in this beautiful, epic poem, says, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you die, I'll die. And Ruth clings to Naomi. Ruth and Naomi, they travel back from Moab to Bethlehem in order to start over. And at the end of chapter one, we focus in on Naomi, bitter and empty and angry. Chapter two, we, we saw how important family was. And so Ruth and Naomi are in this emergency situation. They got to get some food. They got to find some family. And so Ruth goes out to glean in the fields. The Bible tells us that it just so happens that she landed in Boaz's field. Boaz was a relative of Elimelech, Naomi's dead husband. And so when Boaz comes home and he sees Ruth out in the field, immediately he sees hearts in his eyes, right? He, he, he takes one look at her and falls in love. This is one of those love at first sight stories that comes complete with a really awkward pickup line with a, with a, with a weird dinner date and then uh, followed by uh, Boaz getting his wingmen to come try to pull Ruth in and give her some of the perks of him being a, a landowner. At the end of chapter two, Ruth brings all of this food back to Naomi because of Boaz's generosity. And when Ruth, when Naomi finds out where it came from and whose field she had been in, immediately Naomi understands that God has been at work in her family. And Naomi begins to move from bitter to blessed, from empty to full. Now, if you were here last week, you know that in chapter 3, we turned up the heat on the relationship between Ruth and Boaz. This is halfway through the story. It gets a little PG-13, right? Ruth has been working in the fields all season long. They've been flirting with each other in the fields, Ruth and Boaz have. But nobody's really made a move yet until Naomi gets an idea. And she tells Ruth, here's what I want you to do. I want you to wait till he's at night, till he's eaten and, and drank and, and laid down. And I want you to go uncover his feet and lie down with him. And so Ruth does this amazingly provocative thing. And not only does she do that, but then she proposes to him. 
She, a woman, proposes to a man, a, a Moabite to an Israelite, a, a slave girl to a landowner. She proposes to him, and, and all of us kind of collectively held our breath while we waited to hear his answer. Boaz said yes. But he also kind of said yes, but. There was a problem because Boaz was not the closest relative. We've been talking about this concept of the kinsman redeemer, and, and Boaz reminds her there is one closer than me, and we're going to have to navigate this system so that at the end of chapter 3, we find Naomi and Ruth waiting for Boaz to work a miracle to bring Ruth and Boaz together. So now we're in chapter 4. If you brought a Bible with you, go with me to chapter 4. In the book of Ruth, it's in the Old Testament. I'm calling this message, My Place in the Plan. Before we jump into it, let me just set the scene just a little bit. On Friday, Julie and I went out on date night, and we went and saw Murder on the Orient Express. Highly recommend it. Great movie. I'd never read the book. I didn't know the story. And what I love so much about this movie was that there was a twist at the end. I love it when movies do that. I'm not going to tell you what it is. No, no spoiler alert, I promise. But I love movies that have these, these twists at the end. It, it uh, you know, it's a uh, you know, I see dead people, right? You know, or uh, Luke, I am your father, right? All of these movies, I, I love movies that, that kind of build you up. You think you know what happened. You're real sure the butler did it. And then, boom, everything changes. Ruth is written by its author to have one of these epic twist endings to build you up and build you up and build you up just so you think you know where things are going. And then, boom, boom pulls you in a totally different direction. Hang out with me and watch what, watch what happens. Verse 1, chapter 4. It says, Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer that he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Now, throughout the story of Ruth, We've been talking about this concept of kinsman redeemer. This was a, a strategy that God put in place to take care of the needs of God's people. And the rule was that families took care of families. And so if you have a close relative and you find yourself in trouble, that close relative or that kinsman was to redeem you from your trouble. And that had to do with land and it had to do with relationships. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In Leviticus chapter 25, it reminds us that land was everything, that the land that God, the promised land that the people of Israel were living in had been given to them by God and was not to be sold outside of the family. And so when a family member got in trouble, the kinsman redeemer's job was to come by and buy that land from them so it stayed in the family and then when that person got back on their feet, they could buy it back. Or at the year of Jubilee, they would get it back for, for free. And that's part of the role and responsibility of the kinsman redeemer. There was another responsibility of the kinsman redeemer. And this one's a little stranger. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 25. Listen to what it said. I'm just going to read it to you directly. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside of the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate. Now remember, town gate is where Boaz is. This is where business and politics and, and all that kind of stuff happened. She goes to the town gate and says, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of the town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, watch this, this is amazing. His brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face and say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. 
That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. I know, right? Like, wait, what? So this will all make sense here in just a few minutes. So stick with me. But suffice it to say, the kinsman redeemer had some responsibilities in the family. Look at verse 2. Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And so they did so. So what Boaz does is he gathers some witnesses. This is going to be a business transaction, and you need some witnesses in order to do it. Now, things happen at the town gate, and so when you gather the elders, typically there would be a crowd that would gather as well because something cool is about to go down, right? Something's about to happen. And so here is Boaz. He's gathered the elders, and there's this crowd beginning to form, and he's going to make a business proposal. Verse 3. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling a piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. The kinsman redeemer said, I will redeem it. All right, so here's what's going on. Naomi needs some money, and she's going to sell some of her land that belonged to Elimelech because she can't do it. She's a woman. So Boaz, one of her relatives, needs to, needs to broker this deal. And so Boaz comes to this guy, and he says, hey, there's this piece of land And you can get it. And land is everything in this culture. It's everything. And so he thinks about it and he goes, okay, so wait a minute. So what you're telling me is I can get Naomi's land as her kinsman redeemer. But all I really have to do in order to pay for it is bring Naomi into my house and take care of her. And she's beyond childbearing age. So I don't have to worry about having children with her or or naming her son after her dead husband. I don't have to worry about any of that. All I got to do is take care of Naomi. Easy deal. Easy price. This is Boaz making him an offer he couldn't refuse. Right? This This is as good and as easy a decision as it gets. And he says, heck yeah, I'll take the land and everything that comes with it. Now that's a great deal. Unless you're Ruth, right? Because remember, the whole point of this conversation was not to offload land. The whole point of the conversation was to bring Ruth and Boaz together. And so now you're Ruth, and you've kind of gathered on the outskirts of of this conversation, and you're listening to what Boaz is doing, and you're thinking, dude, are you insane? Because what Ruth knows is that she goes with Naomi. They're a package deal. And Boaz has just offered to give it all away. This is insane. If you are reading this for the first time in the, in the, or for the original readers, you're thinking, no, you can't do this. Boaz, what are you thinking? This is the moment in the movie where the princess is forced to marry the evil prince. You know what I'm talking about? This is that moment in the movie where everybody's like, no, it's not supposed to happen this way. This shouldn't happen. But look at verse 5. I love this. It says, Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi and Ruth and the Moabite, you are required, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. And so now everybody goes, oh, I see what you were doing. This is the original bait and switch, right? This is the original set them up and knock them down. Boaz says, hey, I got this great piece of land. It's real easy, real cheap. All you got to do, you know, oh, sorry, did I forget to tell you about the small print? Yeah, um, by the way, this land comes with this lady named Ruth. And by the way, she is of childbearing age. And so, by the way, you're going to have to have a child with her, and you're going to have to name that child after her dead husband, and then that child is going to inherit this land, not you or your children, and that child will not only have rights to this land, but have some inheritance rights to some of your land, and by the way, she's from Moab, and we hate those people. 
<laughs> oh, how smart is Boaz, right? Oh, he is just playing this just right. This was a game changer. So verse 6. At this, the Kingsman Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it because it might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. So the kinsman redeemer says, ooh, thanks, but no thanks. Now that I've read the fine print, yeah, no, I, I don't want to do that. That's going to cause lots of trouble in my family. My, my current wife is not going to be happy with me having to impregnate this other lady. This is just bad. This is bad deal for me. And he's, it's such a bad deal for him that he is willing to risk the social ridicule that would have come from him refusing to fill his family duties. He's risking becoming the family of the unsandaled, right, that we heard about earlier. So the plan works perfectly for Boaz. Look at verse 7 and 8. We get a little history lesson here from the author. It says, Now in the earliest times in Israel, for some redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off a sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. So the kinsman redeemer is sitting here thinking, listen, I do not want my family to be known as the family of the unsandaled, you know, out of Deuteronomy. I definitely do not want Ruth to come and spit in my face, right? Right here in front of all of the elders, all of my family, all of my friends. I do not want that. So what he does is he takes off his sandal and gives it to Boaz as a symbol as I'm giving you my rights. Now you have the right to redeem. Now you have the right to purchase. Now you have the right to move forward. You take care of it. Verse 9 and 10. Boaz announced to the leaders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have brought, bought from Naomi all of the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. So Boaz says, all right, y'all, it's deal. I got the sandal here. This proves it. I have no idea why they gave away sandals, by the way. Anybody else think that's weird? I am, however, saying if you've recently purchased a house and had to fill out all that paperwork, wouldn't it just be easier to just hand the banker your shoe? It's kind of what I'm thinking. Maybe that was what the deal was. Anyway, so Boaz kind of announces to everybody, hey, listen, not only am I taking over this property, but Ruth is my wife. She came to me last night, proposed to me, and this is my public yes. And I've worked through the system. I've gone through what I needed to go through so that this is legal and this is appropriate. And the crowd goes wild. Right? Everybody in the crowd goes wild. Look at verse 11. The elders and all at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So, what happens is the whole crowd goes, all the, all the leaders in town go, well done, Boaz. I see what you did there. You, you kind of baited them with the property, and then you kind of switched it up. We see what you did there. It's very smart. And not only are we impressed with your business sense, but your integrity for demonstrating love to Naomi and to Ruth has touched us. And we want to bless you, Boaz. We want to bless you. As a matter of fact, they blessed him twice. Two different blessings in this. And the first one's really interesting. The first one, they say, may Ruth be like Rachel and Leah. You know who Rachel and Leah are? Jacob's kids, they were the mothers of the 12 tribes of, of Israel. These would have been like the founding mothers, right? These would have been like the first lady. Uh, this, think Martha Washington status, right, in, 
in their lives. This is what, how they would have thought of their And here they are saying, may this Moabite foreigner be like Rachel and Leah, our most venerated women. Second blessing they gave is in verse 12. They said, may your family be like that of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah. Now, this one is a little weird, and we're not going to have time to really dig into this one. But if you want to read a really horrifying, confusing, frustrating story in the Bible, Genesis 38. Write that down. Genesis 38. Go home today and read that. And you'll call me on Monday and go, wait, what the heck was that, Dave? It's the story of Judah and Perez and Tamar. And Tamar is this Canaanite foreigner woman who uh, models as a prostitute, who sleeps with her father. It's this really weird kind of story. And so in their blessing, look what they're doing. They're saying, hey, listen, Ruth, we know you're a foreigner, and we know you've been through some stuff. We know this is less than an ideal circumstance, but we've seen this before. Perez and Tamar and and Judah and the amazing things that came out of that broken relationship. We believe just like God redeemed them, God will redeem you. And this is the blessing they leave on them. Verse 13. This is kind of where the story closes. It says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Then he went to her and and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, whom this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is, listen to this, better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. Now, there's some huge things going on here in this passage. Just in verse 13, we get to a wedding and a baby all in one verse, right? They just kind of fast forward through that that whole thing. And, And it's interesting because the focus really turns off of Boaz and Ruth and onto Naomi, right? Now, all of a sudden, the women of the town are surrounding Naomi, who's holding her grandson, Obed. They're saying, you have a son. You have a daughter-in-law who's better than seven sons, which is maybe the nicest thing you can say to a woman in the Bible. But this is all about Naomi and how Naomi now has her own kinsman redeemer, not in Boaz, but in Obed. And this whole story is a story, or the end of this story reminds us that this is not just the story of Boaz and Ruth, but of how God redeems all people and how Naomi is a part of this promise. And if we were watching this movie for the last four weeks, If we were in the theater, this is where the screen would go to black. We'd see the the end slide on the on on the screen on the on the stage, and and we'd begin to the the lights would come up just a little bit. We'd begin to pick up our stuff and find our coats and pull our feet off the sticky floor and right, you know, and kind of gather your whatever leftover popcorn you have and you'd you'd start talking and say, Hey, that was a pretty good movie. Yeah, that was a good movie. We should go see it again sometime. Maybe I'll get it when it comes out on DVD, right? And if this is the we're watching this as a movie, this is what's happening, and you're halfway out the theater when all of a sudden you hear something change on the screen. You hear something, something else happens. You ever been in the movies where you're just walking out after, during the credits and all of a sudden there are these extra scenes that they show? There are these alternate endings. There are these, you know, uh, preview for the sequel. This is what the author here of Ruth is trying to do. He's trying to get us to get up, stories over, they had the baby, everybody's happy, they all lived happily ever after. But wait, that's not all. That's not it. So the second part of verse 17 says, And they named the baby Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. 
And if you were reading this story for the very first time in ancient Israel, your mind just went poo. You're thinking, oh my gosh, did M. Night Shyamalan write this story? Because that this was the biggest, before you read that sentence, this was just the story of two kids in some backwater town who fell in love. I mean, nice, but who cares, right? But the minute you read this sentence, all of a sudden, everything changed. Everything changes. And remember how the story starts. The story started by saying, in the time of the judges, when everyone did what they thought was right in their own minds, when it, there was chaos, it was everything, everything was a mess. So the story starts in total chaos and ends Four chapters later, by introducing us to the greatest king Israel ever had. Do you see the transformation that happens? This would have been mind-blowing that Ruth, a foreigner from Moab, could become the great-grandmother of the greatest king in history, could be in the line of the Messiah, if you're reading this story for the first time, your mind has just exploded in your head. And all of a sudden, you recognize this is not just some love story. This is not just some movie I went and saw. This is the story of my life. This is a story of God's love for us, redeeming us through his son, Jesus Christ. This is the story of the family of God coming together. This is the story of my brokenness and my pain being redeemed by a God who loves me in this deep and powerful kind of way. All of a sudden, everything changes. I think what makes a great story are great characters, right? Great characters. If you go see uh, uh, Murder on the Orient Express, the, the lead detective, amazing character. He makes the movie. But the characters in this story, I just want to invite you as we close today. I want to spend 30 seconds just inviting you to put yourself in the story, to become a character in the story of Ruth and ask yourself, what are these characters teaching me? One of the biggest characters is Boaz. And for me, he's kind of like, he's a Jesus archetype. He's one who points to Jesus. He's one who reminds us, much like the Passover lamb, much like Abraham and Isaac, much like Boaz, points to Jesus, the Redeemer, our kinsman redeemer. And a kinsman redeemer has to have three key qualities. A kinsman redeemer has to have the right to redeem, the resources to redeem, and the resolve to redeem. So I want to invite you to step into the story and recognize that Jesus is your king, kinsman redeemer who has the right to to redeem as the perfect spotless lamb, who has the resources to redeem as the one who comes from the Father in all glory of heaven and has the resolve to redeem and demonstrated that resolve by going to the cross and giving his life for you. And if it was only you, it would have been enough for him. You Jesus is your kinsman redeemer. What do we learn from Naomi? For me, Naomi is kind of like the church, the family of God as we gather together. It's us gather here today. Naomi, what can this body learn from Naomi? And then one of the characteristics I see in Naomi is that she is the empowering and transforming movement right? That Naomi is the epicenter of where change happens. She moves from bitter to blessed, from hungry to full, from angry to joyful, right? And, and so the church becomes that place where people come in empty and leave full. They walk in bitter, but they leave blessed, 
And this is the call. Naomi also reminds us that the church is a missional movement. She was willing to risk on love. She had a laser focus on what she needed to do. She needed to protect Ruth at all costs. And she was willing to go to extraordinary lengths to make it happen. And Naomi was focused on the future. Did you notice that nowhere in the story does the author spend any time on Naomi thinking about her dead husband or her dead children from the past? Naomi doesn't spend any time looking back. She only spends her time looking forward to a future that God has planned for her. And the, here the cool thing is, remember the blessing of the elders that may you be famous in Bethlehem? 1,100 years later, we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 1, back in Bethlehem, this little backwater town with these two kids named Joseph and Mary trying to figure out what the God has done. And it all started back in Ruth because Naomi was focused on the future. What do we learn from Ruth? And this is where I'll leave us today. Ruth is the redeemed. Ruth is us. Ruth is you. You are Ruth. You are Ruth. I'm Ruth. We are all Ruth. We are the ones who were broken and lost and in need of a kinsman redeemer to come and buy us back. To make a way where there was no way. And so if you look at the characteristics and qualities of Ruth, what you see immediately is that what we know is that Ruth is valuable and worthwhile. That no matter what Ruth thought of herself, you know, I'm just a servant, I'm just a slave, that the kinsman redeemer saw value and worth in her. And that was enough. Ruth had the ability to obey and to trust God. When God spoke, she did. And Ruth lived a life of love and of hope. And so as I look at who I believe God's calling me to be, these character qualities of the redeemed, of you and I, of those of us who didn't have what it took to buy ourselves out, who needed a help, a redeemer in Jesus Christ. And the great news is that God's love story always has a happy ending because love always wins. Not that the journey is always easy, but love always wins. And so, folks, here's the good news. You are Ruth. And I don't know where in that journey of Ruth you are. Maybe you're at the end. Maybe you're at the beginning, somewhere in the middle. I don't know where you are. But you are Ruth. You are the redeemed. Jesus is the redeemer who sees value and worth in you. And this church is the place where you connect the Redeemer and the redeemed. My prayer for you this season as we step into Thanksgiving is for you to just find out what it means for you to be redeemed and say thank you. Just say thank you. Just be thankful. And then know that your thankfulness leads to giving. In this season of giving, give your heart give your love, and give your life. Church, I love you because Jesus loves you. Thanks for being my friend during this series. Next week, we're gonna start a brand new series for Advent. It's called Great Expectations. We're gonna be talking about how to live a life where we expect the unexpected. God bless you. I'll see you next week.